Okay, so welcome to, da uh, to Data Structures, Computer Science 320. Um, here's the syllabus. It's on the course web page. And as you can tell, we are going to be recording the lecture this time for iTunes U. The last time this uh, class was recorded was about five years ago, and a lot has changed since then. So we're going to update the recording on iTunes U. Now, um, I would like to say a word about the course, the objective of the course. There's three bullet points here on the syllabus. And this uh, course is a little bit unique. It's not like the normal data structures courses that you'll find at other places. Because it doesn't have just one goal, it has three goals. And the three goals of this course are, number one, to teach the data structures that are central to computer science. Now, what's a data structure? Anybody know what one is? <laughs> Organizing data. What do you do with data when you organize it? What do, what do you do with data? Store it. You store it, so one's getting it in, and then you what else? Access. And you retrieve it. Yeah, access it. So a data structure is nothing more than a way to organize data so that you can store it a certain way and retrieve it a certain way. And basically, that's, that's what it is. And, but there are many different uh, ways to store and there are many different ways to retrieve. And the particular data structure that you use to store and retrieve data uh, depends on the application. So all of these different ways of storing and, retrie and retrieving data are done, um, you choose one data structure over another one depending on how you want to store it and how you want to retrieve it. And mainly the big thing about it is the performance. So the reason you use different data structures is because different data structures are, have better performance for different situations. Okay, so that's the first goal, to teach data structures central to computer science. And that's normally what you learn in a data structures course. However, in this course, we're going to learn two more things. The second goal is to teach object-oriented design patterns. Now, this concept of object-oriented design patterns is... Uh, really central to software engineering. So in a sense, we're going to combine not just learning about data structures and their algorithms, but we're also going to do, this has an element of software engineering to it. Now, I assume that everybody in here has done C++ before, and we're going to review some C++ in the first chapter here. Um, and I assume that you know what, you've done a little bit of inheritance, you know, uh, we'll, here again, we'll review this and make sure that, that everyone's up to speed on that. But um, the, I want to give a plug here or give you um, a heads up on a book that is called Design Patterns. It is uh, subtitled as Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software, and it was written by four individuals, Eric Gamma, Richard Helm, Ralph Johnson, and John Vlasides. And um, these four authors, this is probably one of the most highly cited books in all of the computer science literature. Everybody knows this book. And it's either called the Gamma Book after the first author or because four people wrote it, it's called the Gang of Four. So if you talk about, in fact, they even, there's an acronym, G-O-F, GOF, the Gang of Four. So all computer scientists know what GOF is, the Gang of Four. And this book is the inspiration for, how, for what we're going to learn here. We're, we are going to apply the object-oriented design patterns that are in this book to data structures, and that's a, a bit unique. So we're, so we're killing two birds with one stone. We're doing some software engineering as well as this traditional data structures. And then the third goal is we're going to do all of this stuff in C++, and it's going to be heavy-duty programming. So... Um, so the three goals are data structures, object-oriented design, and C++. And it's a bit unique. Uh, most data structures courses don't, aren't done this way. And I credit the, the idea of this approach to um, a colleague of mine. His name is Zung Nguyen. He's at Rice University now. And um, which brings me to the book that you'll need for this course. Although I'm plugging this book, it's not required, okay? The book that we're going to use is a, an unfinished uh, manuscript that uh, is online. And so the title of the, uh, one of these days it's going to become a published book, I hope. And it's, the title of the book is Design 
patterns for data structures. Okay. Design patterns for data structures and the abbreviation for this is DP4DS. Design patterns for data structures. And uh, one of the things that goes along with this book is a big software library. And this library has all of these data structures that we're going to study in it with incomplete parts. And your homework assignments are going to be to complete the unfinished parts that are in, the, in this suite of software. Okay? And the software, the software goes by, we're going to call the software um, DP4DS distribution, okay? DP4DS distribution. So one of the things that you have to do uh, tonight is you need to go to the course website and download DP4DS distribution and download the first chapter of the, DP, of the design patterns for data structures. The assignments are all on this course web page, and let's take a. And the assignments generally are going to be due on Tuesdays and Fridays. Okay, so assi uh, programming assignments twice a week. So let's take a look and click on assignment one, and here we see assignment one uh, section and exercise numbers label labeled Gwen refer to the pre-publication manuscript design patterns for data structures available with the materials for downloading. So your assignment for thir uh, Thursday is to study chapter one. We're gonna go over that today. And then uh, do some programming. All right, so it's exercises 1-1, 1-2, and 1-3. Modifications are required for the following files, and there's the files that you'll need to modify. Here's uh, another piece of administrative detail that we have to do for the homeworks. Does everybody know what Everybody know what an I computer science is full of acronyms, an IDE? What's an IDE? Integrated it's an integrated development environment. Okay? Now I'm going to highly recommend that you use a particular integrated development envir environment here that is cross-platform and free, and it's called NetBeans. <laughs> You've heard of NetBeans. Oh yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, we used to use Eclipse, and then that means got better, and then I don't know what the state of Eclipse now, but anyway, it's cross-platform. I don't recommend that you use a platform-specific thing like, I mean, you could, but I don't recommend it. Like you could use uh, what, Xcode for Mac or uh, Studio, or, uh, for, you know, but just, I recommend that we all use NetBeans. Um, and so what you need to do, another th thing that you need to do tonight is get NetBeans installed. There's, there are setup instructions on the course webpage on how to set up for NetBeans and how to set up, how to hand in homeworks and stuff like that. So go to the course webpage, look at those setups, and come tomorrow with questions so that we can get them all straightened out for your assignment for Thursday. Okay? Any questions so far? About any questions now about the course because at, not, now we're going to actually get into the chapter one. Any? Are we good? Okay, so let's start off right with chapter one. Now, another point of interest is that all of these slides are available on the course webpage. So some of you might want to take notes on, electronically on the slides, but however you want to do it is fine. But I'm you, you, there's no need to madly copy down everything that's on the on the slide. One of, for one, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of code walkthroughs in, uh, you know, as, we, as we go along. Actually, let me say a bit, a bit about that. Um, chapters 1 and 2 are a little bit of programming. Chapter 3 is going to be analysis of algorithms, which is going to be mostly math and not very much programming. So the, about the first one-fourth of the course, is not going to be as much programming, but once we get past chapter three, that's when it will be all, all programming. So you, you might think, oh, this course is not, not much programming, but well, that, that might be true at the beginning, but not later on. Okay. 
All right, so chapter one is titled Abstraction. Now, do you guys remember what is abstraction? Anybody? Say it again. Hiding of detail. Yes, the hiding of detail. Abstraction in computer science is hiding detail. All right. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go through and we're going to describe the different kinds of abstraction that you deal with whenever you program in a high order language like C++. Okay, now the first kind of abstraction, and this is, we're going to start at the bottom and we're going to work our way up. The first kind of ab abstraction is called type abstraction. So you know in C++ if you have like an int or a double, you have a variable that has a type, you give it a name like the type is type double or type int. This is an example on the slide of type double. Now what is a type? A type is a collection of all the possible values that a variable of that type can have. So here on the slide we see that if you have a variable x and it's of type double, that x could have a value of 2.0 or 0 0.8 or negative 43.7 or whatever. Like that. Positive, negative, fractional, part, decimal. Okay? So that's type double. So notice that one of these things is that is that double, that word double, hides all those details, all those, that big collection of, of values that it can have. All right, so that's called type abstraction. You use that all the time in programming. Now, another kind of abstraction, a second kind of abstraction at this kind of this, this level is called structure abstraction. Now, when you did C++, I know you, knew, I know you did class, right? But hey, did you ever do struct? No. Well, here it is. Struct rectangle, double length, double width, and a curly brace. Now, does this look like class? Yeah. It looks, actually, it does. In fact, the only difference, now do you guys know private and public access? Yes. Okay, so the only difference between struct and class is that in struct, the default access is, does anybody know? Public. It's public, yeah. Whereas in, if you put class there, then the default access is private. In other words, if you don't say public or you don't say private, that's what it is. That's what we mean by default, right? So now normally um, struct is, is, uh, is used for, for uh, making abstract a type that does not, that, that only has data, all right? So in this struct rectangle, um, what this capital R rectangle is a is a programmer defined word. Okay, so the programmer defined struct is a C++ uh, keyword, but rectangle is a programmer defined word uh, identifier, and the programmer is saying what does a rectangle have? It has a length which is type double and a width which is type double. All right. So if you have a it's not up here, but if you have if you say this if you say if you say rectangle. my rectangle, if you declare my rectangle to be type rectangle, then the way you get to the part of the rectangle is with the dot, right? Is everybody, that's all, this all's review, right? Is everybody good? Okay. And so, and this picture, you know, the diagram that we have, it's like this. You see this one, uh, this one object on the right, or this one item on the right, which is a general rectangle, it could be a tall, skinny one, it could be a long, flat one, it could be, you know, golden ratio, you know, could be, could be whatever. But all of these, all of these possible rectangles are abstracted into this one. See, these are the, po it's like, the, in the same way that those possible values for the type can, you know, that one variable of that type can have any one of those possibles. This one rectangle could have it could be any one of those rectangles. You see, you see how that works? But what are we doing? We're, we're combining two of these types, of two variables of these types into one structure. See, so that's called structure abstraction. Is everybody clear on this? Okay. Now, now in computing there are two different worlds. There's data and there's programs. 
What we've been talking about is what? Data or programs? Be, uh, this stuff that we did before. Are we talking about data or are we talking about programs? Oh, data. Data. <laughs> yeah, this is data, right? I mean, the, oh, the values, the you know, the length, the width, the double. The, you know, that's, the, that's the data side. Okay, on the other hand, programs are statements that execute. Do you see what we're saying here? Programs are like statements that execute. So, at, at, here again, at a real low level, there is what we call statement abstraction. Now, here's the way statement abstraction works. What happens when you write a C++ program? What do you have to do first? After you write the program, what do you have to do to get it to run? You have to compile it. You have to call the compiler. Now, what does the compiler do? It translates it into a lower level language. And what we have, and what we have here on the left is an assembly language sequence of statements that the compiler produces when it translates the, pro the statement on the right. Does everybody see what that? What is that statement on the right? What kind of a statement is it? What does that equals mean? Assignments. That's the assignment statement. So what it does is it computes the stuff on the right, it gets the value, and it assigns it to the param variable. And if you look, uh, now some of you guys have actually had I see some of you have had uh, computer systems and so you know how uh, assembly language works. But basically what, this is, what, what the compiler does is in that first statement it, it, takes, it, it takes the value of length and puts it into register R1, then it puts the value, the, the value of width into register R2, then it adds register R1 plus R2 and puts the result in register R3, and then it and then it uh, multiplies 2.0 times register R3, puts that in register R3, and then it takes what's in register R3 and it gives it back to param. So I don't expect you to kind of like, you know, know all the details, but you see all that stuff happens in the central processing unit, the CPU and in the main memory of the computer, but those statements have to execute to do this. So whenever you write this in C++, the statement on the right, the compiler translates it to the assembly language statements, and then when you execute, it's boom, 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 boom. Those statements execute to do this one here. So do you see how it's like one thing here corresponds to several things over here, and those details are hidden. You don't have to know, you've, you write program statements like this all the time in C++, you don't have to know anything about, about what's going on under there. That's abstraction. What's the key idea behind abstraction? Hiding, Hiding details. So see, high level programmers, th those details are hidden. But nevertheless, it is an abstraction, all right? So that's statement abstraction. Now, in C++, what happens if, how do you combine several statements so that you can just do one statement and have several statements like this execute? What is that called? Yeah, that's a function, all right? Or also called a procedure, okay? A procedure, I, sometimes I use the word procedure to be a function that returns void, but that's kind of how I, I kind of like to use the term. Okay, so here's an example of in procedure abstraction. So, for example, if you write a if you write a uh, statement called perimeter that returns a double, then what you can do is you can say you can you can here at a higher level of abstraction you can say C out so stream to the output stream perimeter my rectangle and you can give it a rectangle and it will go through and it will do all the more complicated things all right so everybody clear on how that works okay and here's another one here's another example um, GCD stands for greatest common divisor so and this is a little recursive routine that computes the greatest common divisor if uh, of m and n where m and n are integers and if zero equals equals n you return m otherwise you return the greatest common divisor of n and what is this m per what is this remainder. yeah uh, mod, mod yeah remainder mm -hmm. and it's recursive and you and you can say temp gets the greatest common divisor of the numerator and the denominator and now what is this one statement here corresponds to what many statements there so if you had this in a library you could call it, and this would all be what? Hidden. Hidden. Okay. See? Abstraction. Is everybody with me on this? Okay, so what kind of abstraction is that? Procedure, Procedure abstraction. So now, what are the four kinds of abstractions we've had so far? Type, 
and then structure. Now that's on the data side. And then what do we have? Statement and procedure. Are you with me? Okay. And now what do we do for the next level up? We combine now the type and the statement. No, sorry, the type and the structure was on what side? The data side. And then the what? The statements are on the programming side. So now what do we do? Now, 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 what do we, now, now what do we do? We put those together and what kind of abstraction do we have? We have class abstraction. Now is everybody, all this is review, right? You put these together and you have a class. Alright? So here, the, in this figure, on the left, we have a struct rectangle with length and width and we have a double area. Uh, so area is a function that would compute the area of a rectangle. And perimeter is a function that would compute the perimeter of a rectangle and return a double. Are you with me? And then we combine these together and now you see over here on the right, instead of saying struct, we say class. But we could just as easily say struct in C++ because, you know, we're specifying what the accesses are anyway, private and public anyway, right? So anyway, it's class, but convention is to do, is, is when you combine, the convention is that when you combine the data with the operations that you call it a class, okay? And um, so now the length and the width are private uh, uh, very, uh, attributes of the class and then area and perimeter are public. So now you guys know the difference between private and public. Why, uh, why do we have area and perimeter public? What does that allow to happen? Well, the user, yeah, it, the user can access it. Are you with me? But a user can't say, it, it, with this setup, you cannot say my rectangle dot length gets 3.7. You can't say that because length is private. Is everybody clear? But you can say, you can't, you can't say see out what? My rectangle dot area or whatever because area is public. Is everybody clear on that? Now, here's another thing that we're going to have to, that we're going to use a lot. What's this little rectangle down here? Oh, I shouldn't have said a rectangle. What's this box? Well, there's no, not, no, not, not inheritance. Actually, it's not quite inheritance. But, but, but what's the language? This, this box is a certain language. Have you learned of this? Yeah, what is it? There's an acronym for it, okay? Unified. Yeah. yeah, 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 good, good job. Okay, this is UML, all right? Unified Modeling Language. Unified Modeling Language, UML. This is an example of a UML class diagram. Now there's three components, three compartments in a UML class diagram. The top compartment contains the what of the class? The name. So the name of the class is rectangle. So that, the C++ code here is class rectangle. Is everybody clear? Okay. The second compartment always contains the what? The attributes, okay? So here we have, oh and by the way, notice that in C++ it's double length, but in UML it's length colon double. And what's with this hyphen, this minus sign in front, what is that? That corresponds to private, is correct. Okay? And then the third compartment always contains the what? The operations. All right, and in this particular example, the area and the perimeter are the operations. And what do you? And again, here you would say double area, so area area returns type double. Here you say area colon double, and what? And was the plus? Public. Public. Does everybody see how to read that? And how and how the UML diagram class diagram corresponds to the C++ code? Are we good? Now, here's the thing that's unfortunate about computer 
programming languages. Every language has their own set of terminology. And I, I don't, you know, I wish that it was, uni I wish it were unified. I wish that, uh, but it's not, okay? So as a first cut at this, let's take a, let's take a look at some of this OO object. Oh, by the way, OO means object oriented, this object oriented terminology. Okay, so when you hear the word class, generally speaking, that, you should think of that as a type. Class correspond, class in, the class of an object corresponds to like the type of a variable. And the object, when you hear the word object, the object corresponds to the variable itself. All right? And the word method in object-oriented terminology corresponds to a procedure or a function. In C++, they don't call them procedures, they call them functions. All, you know, function that returns void. Well, you know. All right? But that's the correspondence, and I have a tendency to flip back and forth between, you just gotta have to kinda go with the flow on that. And here is figure 1.6 in the chapter one, is a more extensive uh, comparison of the different term, term, terms. So class means the same thing both in UML terminology and in C++. The superclass, now we haven't actually talked about behavior abstraction yet, but, or, or sorry, about um, inheritance yet, but in UML terminology, the superclass corresponds to what you would call the base class in C++. So you have the superclasses on top and the subclasses on the bottom. So in C++, the, the superclass is the base class and the subclass is called the derived class. And then an attribute, we just said on the previous slide, we, talk, we talked about length and width being attributes in C++. Those are called, sometimes called data members in C++. And an operation or a method in UML terminology is called a member function. And visibility is access specifier. Parameterized class is a template. We'll talk about templates. Have you guys done templates? C++ templates? Anyway, we'll, we'll do them extensively. Um, so in UML terminology, a template is called a parameterized class. And then, the, oh, this is going to be a key one, the, the last one. The word abstract in UML terminology is called pure virtual in C++. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so let's see then how if you set up your data like this with um, a rectangle having uh, attributes, length and width, which are type double, and area and perimeter, which return type double, then how do you use it? First of all, this, this next part of the slide shows how you would define the perimeter method, or the, all right? And what is this double colon thing? Have you guys seen that before? Isn't that when you're talking about classes? You have to yeah, it's the fully, it, it, yeah. he, he, this double colon, is, he, always think of this. When you see that double colon, just think, that's the fully qualified class name, uh -oh. all right? So notice that what's in, what's in front of the double colon, that's rectangle, the name of the class. The name of the method itself is perimeter. Now why would you have to say rectangle colon colon perimeter? Why not just say perimeter? Because there might be another what? There might be a what of another what? There might be a perimeter of a what? Of another class, right. So sometimes you need to fully qualify, sometimes you don't, but sometimes you need to fully qualify the name of the, of the method, the name of the function. Does everybody see how that what the idea is there. All right, and um, and what what length what is what length is this length? This length is the attribute is one of the attributes of the rectangle, right? So then, uh, as I put up on the board just a minute ago, if you you could have like um, a 
variable called my rectangle and it is of type capital R rectangle and if it is then it, it's like an object of this class and the way you would call the perimeter is you could say C out so stream to the output my rectangle dot perimeter is everybody is this all familiar because look the way the way you would access the length would be my rectangle dot length. So the way that you call a function is my rectangle dot the function. So everybody see how that works? It's all review, right? Now we get to the highest level of abstraction with um, object-oriented programming, and that is called behavior abstraction. Now with behavior abstraction is what happens is you have an abstract shape. So it's not just that this one rectangle could be all these different kinds of rectangles. Are you with me? Now it's what? One abstract shape could be what? Any, Any one of these shapes, one of which is a rectangle, but it could be a circle or it could be a rectangle. Are we good? Okay, so now we are combining these classes into one abstract class. And when you do that, that's the highest level. That's behavior abstraction. You could do, it's easy to do this without doing this, but we will, this is the way we'll always do it. We'll, we'll have an abstract one which can correspond to these. All right, so now comes the symbol, the UML symbol. The way we draw this diagrammatically is at the top we have the abstract shape and what is this open triangle symbol? That is the symbol for what? Somebody said it a minute ago incorrectly but now you can say it and be correct. Inheritance. inheritance. Now there's the inheritance. Okay. So what this says is that a line inherits from abstract shape, a rectangle inherits from abstract shape, a circle inherits from abstract shape, and a right triangle inherits from abstract shape. Are we good? That's figure 1.7 in the book. And here is the way we, uh, in figure 1.8, is the way we show the UML class diagram for an abstract shape and the corresponding C++ code, right? So now, what's at the top of the UML diagram? The name, so what's the name? A shape. What does the A stand for? Abstract. abstract. So that's the abstract shape. And what's the second thing? What's, all, what's always in the second compartment in the UML class diagram? The attributes. the attributes. So does an abstract shape have any attributes? No. It can't. It could be, if it was a rectangle, it would have to have one kind of attributes. If it's a circle, it has to, has to have a radius or a diameter. That's another kind. So it does, no attributes. But what does it have for the methods or the functions? What does it have? Area, Area scale, perimeter, scale, scale, display, prompt and set dimensions. Is everybody clear? Okay. And each one of these returns something. What does area return? A double. So that's a double precision real because the area is a real number, right? And what does the perimeter return? A double. And what does scale return? No, that's the parameter. If it, hmm? Look, uh, th this factor is this the a is this is this factor the actual parameter or the formal parameter? Do you guys remember that terminology? That's the formal parameter of the function. But what does it return? You still didn't answer. What is it? Does it return no. <laughs> void. Yeah, there's nothing there. It's void. Oh. Void. So what it does is it scales. See, but it doesn't return anything. Right. It's, it, it changes the, the size of the object. It scales it. Like if you put a two there for the factor, it goes up by a factor, the size goes up by a factor of two. Yeah. And display prints out a display, but doesn't return anything, but it, as a side effect, it prints out a display. And then prompt and set dimensions is for the main program is going to ask the user to add, do some dimensions, blah, blah, blah. And every shape is going to have is going to have to have one of, is going to have to have these each one of these. Is everybody clear on that? And so now that's the UML diagram. Now what about the what about the um, the C++ code? 
So we have class A shape. And now, you, here's a more review. What is this tilde A shape? That's called the what? That's the destructor. Okay. And here's our double area. Now, um, we have virtual on one side and we have equal zero on the other side. Now, does that, have you guys had this before? That makes this abstract. Okay. Th this in UML term, this is called a uh, pure virtual function in C++. It's called abstract in uh, UML terminology. And what this means is that is that area is not implemented in the abstract class. It has to be implemented in the concrete class, in the subclass. All right? And uh, each one of these, the uh, ne next part of the slide is the, is the rest of the abstract shape. So we have a perimeter, the post condition, that post means post condition. Okay, so for perimeter, the post condition is the perimeter of this shape is returned. For scale, there is a precondition and a post condition. Now you guys have done preconditions and post conditions, right? Okay, <laughs> yeah. And so the precondition is the factor has to be greater than zero. So why would that be a precondition? Because you, if it were like negative two, you, your dimensions, how can you have negative two centimeters, uh, you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's illegal, basically. This, this means it's going to be illegal, right? Okay, so post condition, this shape's dimensions are multiplied by factor. And then display, blah, 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 the shape's name and dimensions are printed to, the o, to OS. Oh, by the way, what does OS stand for? That, this is a convention. Output stream. Yeah, OS is the output stream. And then prompt and set dimensions. Post condition, this shape's dimensions are prompted and set. No dimension is negative. Is everybody good? Yeah. Why do someone only have post conditions? Why say, say that again? Why do someone only have Yeah, because if it doesn't have a precondition, that means that there are no preconditions. In other, in other words, there are no restrictions on, on what it takes to call this. See, there's a restriction. A precondition is a is puts a restriction. If you call a function with a precondition and you violate that precondition when you call it the program will crash with an error message. But if it doesn't have a precondition, that means you can call it and it'll never crash. Yeah? Where are you like setting the preconditions? That is a really good question and we are going to do that tomorrow Great. because it's time to go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good deal. See you tomorrow. <laughs>